All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Haley Munson. I am with Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District. And today we are going to be discussing irrigation and watering basics. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping. Um, your mics are muted. So if you have any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat box feature if you have any questions and we can get to them either during the presentation as well as after we will have time for Q&A. Um, and then also towards the end of the presentation, we will be discussing a raffle. So if you stay through the end of the presentation, um, there will be a chance for you to be entered into a raffle. So please feel free to stick around. And like I said, um, the class will be about 45 minutes and then there'll be time at the end for our Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pass this over to our presenters today with us. We have Marianne and Isabel. They are with the water keepers and they will be going ahead and they will be presenting our topic today. And uh, let me see here, Isabel and Marianne, I'm going to be giving you guys, um, I'm going to be unmuting your microphones right now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Okay, it's nice to see everyone this morning. It's ironic that we're doing an irrigation workshop on a rainy day. I got <laughs> rain here and uh, Isabel said she actually got hail. So um, lots of moisture coming from the sky. Um, I'm Marianne Hugo and my colleague Isabel Hernandez is with us today. And we're from Inland Empire Waterkeeper. Um, our logo here is on the screen and you're welcome to go to our website to find out more about what we do. Um, one of the programs that we um, offer is called Smartscape, and it's a program that helps people, obviously, with smart landscape. And one of the things that we specialize in is assisting people with irrigation. And irrigation is actually really my favorite topic, and I know Isabel just loves it as well. Um, you know, when I first started out, I was mystified by irrigation. But now that I've gotten more into it, it's actually really fun. So hopefully you will feel the same after today's workshop. All right, Haley. Okay, so to start out, I'd like to tell people a little bit about myself. And Isabel will also be telling you a little about herself in a, in a bit. Um, this is my house. And I embraced irrigation when I transformed my garden into a water-wise, water-friendly garden. Um, doing my yard myself really forced me to figure out my irrigation and how it worked and how it was all put together. And I think that's when I really, really clicked for me how my irrigation worked is by actually doing it myself. And of course, something like this is always trial and error. Um, but after you do it a while, you, you get much better at it and it's not so mysterious to you. My neighbors love my yard. I always get people knocking on my front door. Oh, who did your yard for you? And when I say, oh, I did it myself and you can too. You know, people get excited of all the possibilities. All right, Haley, thank you. And this is my backyard. I actually did my backyard not too long ago, about four or five years ago. And I retrofitted my backyard. I have drip and I have pop-up sprinklers both. And we'll talk to you today about how you can combine the two, depending on what areas of your yard you are watering. So I have drip and I have rotary head sprinklers. And it's been great. My water bill has gone down about 30% just since I made the switch to um, water efficient irrigation. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, you probably wouldn't be attending this workshop today if you weren't already aware of how important it is to save water. Um, we're not in a drought, officially declared drought, but we live in Southern California. And as we all know, Southern California and just California in general tends to be a dry or drier state than many other places. So it really behooves all of us to just be aware of just in general how you can save water. And this chart, I really like it because it shows things, you know, if you do, just did these six simple things, you would really be saving a lot of water. Um, the first one's really obvious it's about using a broom to clean your outside areas. I can't tell you how many times I go in front of my house 
and my next door neighbor is out there washing down their sidewalk and their front of their house with the hose and the water's just pouring into the gutter. I feel like rushing over and, and giving my neighbor a broom is a gift, but I highly doubt, you know, you have to be careful how you ease people into things, but I use a broom and it works just great. Um, the middle one here, you need to adjust your sprinkler heads and we're going to talk about that. And um, it's really easy to do. I'll talk about it. And Isabel's is also going to go into more depth about that. Um, we're also going to talk about mulching today. Mulch is your friend. If you, I tell people, if you only do one thing after this workshop, if you only go out and do one thing, it's got to be mulching. Mulching is fabulous. Just mulching alone will reduce your water use probably at least by 15%. And it's really healthy for your plants. I'll talk, talk about more about that later. For those of you that have grass and that plan on keeping your grass, you always want to grow, uh, mow your grass high. You need to mow your grass at least so it stays at least three inches. I have a, we have a gardener on our street that comes through and throughout the years, he's basically does everybody's grass on the street. And he's got that mower set down to the lowest setting. And he just goes and mows every house on the street as low as he can. And I keep, you know, I used to have him before I transitioned to my yard. And I would always say to him, set your mower high, set your mower high for my yard. And he, he never would do it. He doesn't want to take the time to do it. But if you mow your own grass or you have a gardener that you can actually get to do what you ask them to do, mow your grass to least three inches. Um, the center one is installing drip, which I'm going to talk about. And Isabel is also going to talk about. And then also you're going to want to plant drought resistant trees and plants. And we'll get more into that. All right, Haley. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about before we get into the nitty gritty of irrigation, you know, knowing about irrigation is great, but you really need to know some background information. Why do I want to install water-wise irrigation? Why do I want to spend the time to figure out drip? Why do I want to do this to begin with? You know, helping the environment and saving water is so crucial here in California. The other thing is when you water your plants correctly, they just look better. And the other thing you can do that to tie into all of this is to, you can reduce the amount of turf that you have in your yard. Turf is the number one water eating crop in America. Americans use more water to water turf than any other crop. It's just astounding how much water it takes to water your turf. So if you want to reduce your turf, and this is a picture of my yard where I, you can actually go ahead, Haley, it's fine. This is my yard when I took my grass out. What's really neat is that right now there's a fabulous rebate that you can get. And uh, we'll talk about where you can go to get all this information. But if you're at all interested in reducing your turf or taking your turf out, there's never been a better time. The rebate that there's now through the Metropolitan Water District is fabulous. And... Um, I took all my grass out and I have to say I have not missed it, but there are reasons why you may want to keep some turf. So if you want to ease into it and just take part of your turf out, that's fine too. But you'll find that reducing your turf is really a great way to um, optimize your water usage. And it's also a great, if you're putting in new irrigation, it's, it makes sense to do both projects at once. All right, Haley, thank you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about water and irrigation. You can have the best, most efficient irrigation for your turf and your, your turf still won't look good and you'll be wasting tons of water if your turf has not been dethatched. And what dethatching is, it's where you remove all the dead material from your turf. And the way I can describe it is if you go and walk on your turf and it's really thick and bouncy, I have all my neighbors have this problem. You walk on their turf and it's like you're you're on this cushion. And if you take your hands and you lift up the turf and you look underneath, all underneath the turf, what you're going to see is you're going to see brown. 
So the green is only on top and underneath is the brown. And you can see this little, little chart here. What this extra thatch layer does is it prevents the water from reaching the roots of the grass. So what this means is that even though you install all new, brand new rotary head sprinkler heads, which will save you water, the water is still not going to go where it needs to go. It's going to run off. Now, I have a picture here of a rake just for illustrative purposes so you can see the brown thatch. There's actually a machine that you can rent that will um, dethatch your lawn for you. And if you use a gardener, he'll know where to get one. And in fact, have your gardener do it for you. Um, but it's really important that you do that. And I would say some people do it every year, but if you've never done it, you'll be surprised um, the difference that it will make. All right, Haley. And then the other thing that you're going to do, want to do is called aerating. And I'm sure many of you have seen this out when you've been at a park or somewhere. You see grass and there's all these plugs. If you look at the lower picture, you'll see these little plugs. Often people think they're from dogs, but they're not. They're actually plugs of soil that have been pulled out of the ground. And what that does is it aerates your lawn and it lets the water soak down to the roots. So these two things, dethatching and aerating, are really, really, really important because like I said before, no matter how great your sprinklers are, the water is not going to water the roots of your lawn if it can't reach the soil. So if you haven't done these two things, check with your gardener and see, um, see if they can do it for you. Thank you, Haley. Okay, now, have you ever seen, and maybe you've had this problem, a beautiful green lawn, the whole lawn looks beautiful. And then there's one spot that's yellow or brown. Normally what that is due to is that spot is not getting water. When you install your sprinklers, you want to make sure that you have what's called head to head coverage. And the new water efficient rotary head sprinklers make it really easy for this to happen because you can adjust them. But what you can do, and if you, before you do anything, if you have lawn now, you can go out and you can see if you have head to head coverage. And you can also see how long it takes for your grass to receive an inch of water. Now, if you go to a big box store, you can buy these cute little containers you'll see here in this bottom picture. It's basically a spike with a little cup on it. But I didn't happen to have any of those at my house one day when I did this a few years ago. So I just used a tuna can and you can use any kind of can or you can even use a paper cup. You just wanna make sure that it's not gonna fall over. And you can put those out in your grass and run your sprinklers for, oh, maybe 20 minutes and go out and look. What you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out how many minutes it takes for that can or that container to get in a half an inch of water. And add a, add a half an inch of water, then you're gonna know that that's how long you need to run your sprinklers for. And you're also going to know, find out if you have places in your lawn that are receiving no water or minimal water. And that way you can adjust your sprinklers. And, um, Isabel will talk a little bit more about how to adjust your sprinklers, but this is a really great way to get an idea of places that you're missing. All right, Haley. Okay, and this is what I was just mentioning. Adjusting your sprinklers is really easy. All of the new um, rotary head sprinklers come with a little tool. Um, some just use a regular screwdriver, but as you can see in the other pictures, when you buy your sprinkler, it comes with a little plastic tool that you just pop on the top. It's really easy to do. Um, it's nothing that you need to have some a gardener do for you. Once you um, learn how to do it, it's really easy. All right. And this is just for illustrative purposes. This is actually, I took this picture in front of my house. This is my next door neighbor's lawn. And she runs her sprinklers in the morning. Um, they usually come on around 6.30 or 7. She doesn't get up, though, until 10. So all of her water from her sprinklers is running off into, it's not now because I talked to her about it and I helped her remedy the situation. But this is what use, was happening before she was aware of it. 
one, she was running her sprinklers too long. Two, she hadn't dethatched her grass. And three, she had two sprinkler heads that were broken. So the majority of her water was running off of her grass down into the street. So my point is here, one, turn your sprinklers on during the day and let them run. And so if you have this situation or something like this, you can see it. Don't just let your sprinklers run when you're sleeping because oftentimes things can go on. And you can see from the, the driveway there, see that moss? That's an indication that this has been going on for, for not just one day. So this happens quite often. I see this a lot in my neighborhood where people never leave their house. They never check anything. So just on a Saturday when you're home and the sun's out and it's nice, just run your irrigation and just take a look and see if you can spot these things. And, you know, it's really great until about, oh, maybe about four years ago, there was really no such thing as organic lawn food. One of the things about fertilizing your lawn is that a lot of the fertilizer, uh, studies have shown about 30% of the fertilizer that you apply to your lawn actually flows right off into the gutter down our storm drains and out to our watershed and to our oceans. What's great about using an organic product is that if some of your fertilizer does run off, it's not so detrimental to our waterways. So it's really nice that now you can go to a big box store and actually purchase an organic product. So look for organic lawn food when you're out shopping. All right. Okay. Now the next part of water-wise irrigation are your plants. You can have wonderful water-wise irrigation, but in order to complete the package on your property and to really be a water efficient yard or a water efficient, you know, your own little micro system, you really need to install some plants that are water-wise. And that's my little doggy there in the garden. Um, Water-wise plants are so neat and they're so wonderful and there are so many choices. It used to be years ago, water-wise plants were really hard to find. I've been doing this water-wise thing, I call it my water-wise passion for a long time. And when I first started, I used to have to drive around to specialty nurseries and, you know, really do a lot of homework about where I could find plants. Now, if you go to any nursery or even the big box stores, the coin has flipped and the majority of plants that you'll find are water wise. So it's a lot easier now to find really beautiful plants. But if you're going to install drip, you're going to put in your water efficient irrigation, having the right plants to go along with it really is the key. And you can get so many beautiful, colorful plants. It's not just oftentimes when you mention water wise to someone, they're thinking that you're thinking cactus and rocks. You don't have to have any of that. I have a beautiful lush yard that's full of flowers and, and just shrubs that are just gorgeous. So the, the possibilities are just endless on the plants that you can pick now. Succulents are great. Um, I have numerous succulents at my house. I have them in pots and you can also run drip to your pots. I have succulents in the ground. They're just a really versatile plant. Uh, they use the least water of any water wise plant because the majority of them actually store water in their leaves. And what's neat about them is there's such a variety of color. It's really neat. I have succulents intermingled with my other water wise plants. And Isabel will talk a little bit about this, but when you plant your yard, what you're going to do is you're going to do something called hydrozoning. And what that means is that you're going to put plants that have like water requirements together. And your really neat water-wise plants come in um, moderate, low, and very low. So succulents are considered very low. So if I was doing a section of my yard with succulents, I could also intermingle other water-wise plants that also have very low water requirements. And that's called hydrozoning. 
And then there are California natives and there are so many beautiful natives. And again, they all have the same water requirements. So you could, if you wanted to, you could do your whole yard in natives. Natives are just beautiful. Um, as you know, natives are, are thrive here in California. They originated here in California. And what's great about the natives is that when you plant California natives, it makes your um, yard a beautiful, beautiful pollinator garden. I have um, hummingbirds. I have butterflies. I have moths. I have all kinds of um, all kinds of insects. Um, I have native bees. I have bumblebees and I have all kinds of native bees that come to my yard. It's just really besides having a beautiful yard, it creates a whole ecosystem. And it's just beautiful. I love sitting on my patio and you get to see all the native plants and all the creatures that come in. And um, again, they have the same water requirements. So it's a really great way to reduce your water and add color to your yard. And, you know, trees are a wonderful thing. When you decide to plant your yard, you most likely are going to want to add trees because what trees do for you is they'll add some height and some color and some texture to your yard. There are so many great water wise trees. Uh, one of the resources that we're going to provide to you today is a link to a site where you can actually go online and look at all the different trees. Um, these are two of my favorites. Um, the yellow one is a Palo Verde tree, and they're really popular because they are just they're just gorgeous, and you see them all throughout Southern California. And then the other tree that's also very popular right now is a crepe myrtle. They come in so many colors, and they're just a great pollinator tree, and they can exist on relatively little water, which makes them a really good choice for the Inland Empire. Okay, so one of the things that's going to really make a difference in your yard is you need to figure out what kind of soil you have. Well, why would you, why would you care about what kind of soil you have? Well, there's numerous reasons. Your irrigation is going to be programmed, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that with Isabel, but you are going to have a timer. And it's going to either be a smart timer or it will be a timer that you program yourself. So the amount of time that you will be watering your yard is going to be determined by what kind of soil you have. Clay soil holds the water a lot longer than a sandy, silty clay. I mean, I'm sorry, a sandy, silty um, composition. So what you're going to want to do is figure out what kind of soil you have. If you've gardened in your yard at all and you've ever planted a plant and dug a hole, most likely you already know what kind of soil you have. I have terrible clay soil at my house. I mean, it's just when you go out, you can almost make little clay figurines out of my soil. It's so, so clay-like. But if you're not aware of what kind of soil you have, um, you can do an experiment where you go out and put some of your soil in a jar with some water. And again, the instructions on how to do this are in the link that we're going to provide you. So don't worry now about, you know, getting everything perfect. We'll provide you instructions. But the idea is, is that you put water and your soil together in a jar and you combine them and shake them really well. And you let the jar sit for about two days. And if you look at the illustration, you'll see what happens the heavier soil drops to the bottom and the lighter, everything lighter comes to the top. And you'll be able to see what kind of soil you have. You can also send your soil off to have it analyzed. Um, that costs about $100 to do that. And I've only done it once. And the results I got back were the same results that I got doing it myself. So you probably don't need to spend $100. You can do this test in lieu of paying money. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned this at the beginning of my talk and I wanna emphasize how important mulch is. Along with installing water-wise irrigation, you really, really, I cannot emphasize the importance of mulch. Mulch is what keeps the water in the soil. It keeps your soil from drying out. So it keeps your water from evaporating. 
And mulch is actually like a multivitamin for your plants. What it does is it keeps the soil cooler. So the roots of your plants stay cooler. And mulch is actually an organic product. So mulch actually breaks down and becomes part of your soil. So the point of mulching is that mulch actually changes the composition of your soil. When I moved into my house, I've lived here now about 20 years, my soil was just the worst imaginable soil. It was probably the soil that the builder brought in. It was terrible. I have been mulching my yard now for 20 years. And finally, after doing this consistently for that long, I can actually go out, not everywhere, but a lot of parts of my yard, I can actually go out now and I can actually put a shovel in the ground and the shovel will move down into the soil and I can flip the soil. So what's happened is, is all that mulch has broken down over the years and created and improved the quality of my soil. So mulch is really, really a great thing. And the main thing is, especially in the Inland Empire, it's going to get really hot in the summer. And this mulch will keep the roots of your plants cool. Now, when you go to get mulch, you're going to want to buy mulch in bulk. And most nurseries or most um, mulch yards will deliver mulch to your house. When I did my yard, I did 10 cubic yards, but I put an illustration here so you can see what five cubic yards are. Um, when they delivered this mulch, they brought it and they dumped the 10 cubic yards of mulch in, in a pile in my driveway. So if you have a gardener, you can tell your gardener you're getting mulch delivered and believe it or not, I'm, your gardener has a zillion people in the industry and he can round up some of his friends and they can come and they can spread the mulch in your yard. Or what I did is I told my neighbors, hey, I've got extra mulch. Would you like some for your yard? Help me spread some mulch in my yard and then everything that's left over you can take. <laughs> so I got a few ambitious young neighbors to come over and help me with the mulch. And then what was left over, I shared with my neighbors. And here I wanted to show you this. When you go to Lowe's or any, you know, I shouldn't just say Lowe's, Home Depot, any big box store and you walk in and you ask for mulch, this is where the person at that works there is going to point to a big, huge stack of plastic bags and say, there's the mulch. Well, this is not mulch. Um, most likely they're going to sell you this one here that says Color Guard. Um, what they've done is they take wood chips and they use artificial dye and they dye wood chips. They usually come in three colors, um, brown, black, and real like a uh, terracotta red color. This is not truly mulch. What they are is they're dyed wood chips. And there's a reason why it says color guaranteed. It's because they're artificially dyed. They will not break down. They will not improve the quality of your soil. And they just it's not a good product. And then there's one over here that you'll see it's red mulch. And it, it scares me because if you look at the top picture, it actually shows a flower bed. Do not put rubber mulch around your plants. I had a neighbor who did this. Of course, all her plants died. It's fine. If you look at the bottom picture on the bag, they have it under a swing set, which is perfectly fine. But you really don't want to put this around your plants. Now, if you live in the Inland Empire and you live somewhere that's super, super, super windy, there's a couple things you can do. Um, the bigger your mulch is, the bigger the pieces of your mulch are, the less likely they are to blow away. So you could use, mulch comes in a variety of sizes. I went to my nursery to look at the mulch first before I had it delivered. I chose a smaller, medium-sized mulch. But if you live somewhere where it's really windy, you can get larger mulches, or you can even go to an organic wood chip. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use, a lot of people use um, rocks and gravel. And that's also fine, too. The, the difference is the, gra the gravel and the rocks will not help cool your soil in the summer but it's still better than having just completely bare soil. 
but I know there are places in the Inland Empire where the wind just blows like crazy and you'll put mulch down and you go back out and it's all gone. So I understand that. That's where a lot of people, Isabel can talk more about that at her part. Isabel actually lives in Eastvale and she's had some terrible winds at her house. And I think she mulched once and went out and my mulch is gone. So Isabel, will give, when it's her, her portion of the workshop, she's going to give you some tips about how to handle wind. And Marianne, we actually just got a question that relates to this topic. And the question is, are mulches and wood chips the same thing? Um, you know what? They can be. It's really important. You know, it's funny. The industry is not exactly standard. Before you buy anything, just make sure if you're going to buy something that's marked wood chips, just make sure that they're organic and they're not artificially colored. If you go to a nursery and you want, say you want wood chips, just say that the are they organic and I want something without artificial color and you'll be fine. What you want to avoid is what the big box stores sell. Everything that they sell is full of artificial dye. Thank you. And then I actually have one more question related to mulch. And um, this person says that every time that they put mulch in, they get pincher bugs. Is there is there a relation to uh, the two? No, you know what? No, there's not a relationship to that, but I can tell you that pincher bugs like moist, moist areas. And you may be have an area that's getting overwatered. And if an area remains too wet, you te it tends to attract pincher bugs and just insects in general. So more than it being the mulch, it's probably the fact that that area is being overwatered. I've seen mulch when it continuously stays wet, all the insects migrate to that. You get the little pill bugs, you get the pincher bugs, you get the earwigs. So more than likely, it's probably a combination of, and the other thing is, uh, one thing I didn't mention, and thank you for your question, because this made me remember something. When you put your mulch down, you want your mulch to be about three inches thick. Two and a half to three inches is all you want to do. If your mulch is any thicker than that, it'll remain wet and then you'll get more insect coming. So make sure that your mulch is not any thicker than three inches. So check your, your height of your mulch, your thickness, and check your water. Most likely it's those two things. That's great. Thank you. And then just one more question is where can you find a bulk of organic mulch? Okay, we're going to provide you some resources, and I'm actually going to, um, Isabel's going to talk more about that. One of the things I didn't mention, and um, I'm just going to say this now, at the end of this presentation, um, when you'll be able to access this presentation, I have included an email um, for both Isabel and I. And what you can do is you can email us. Let us know exactly where you live. I'm presuming you live somewhere, you know, near Elsinore, Lake Elsinore. And I think Isabel actually already has done some research. I'll let her talk about that. But I believe Isabel has some places that she can recommend where you can go to get mulch. Um, we did a workshop for, um, we've done a couple of workshops and I know we've gotten this question before. So I, Isabel is shaking her head. I think we do know where you can go locally to get mulch. So we'll provide that for you. Great, thank you. Okay, oh, funny, we're talking about Isabel, meant to be. Okay, this is Isabel's yard. And Isabel, as you can see, has used both a combination of uh, mulch. No, you didn't, actually, that's no mulch. That is actually, I believe, lava rock. Yes, it you is. Know, Isabel talk because she knows her yard much better than I do. But this yard, Isabel's yard has always impressed me. When I first met Isabel, she showed me her yard like the first couple days that I met her. And I'm like, wow, that is really impressive. So I'd like to introduce Isabel to you and she will take you more into the irrigation. Well, thank you, Marianne. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I do want to talk about in my landscape is that I have a corner lot. I'm at the uh, front of a cul-de-sac and when I get winds because I'm in the Inland Empire um, of course I get winds and they hit and it's kind of like a little whirlwind it kind of hits my house and goes in both directions and so of course 
Um, the first year I removed my lawn, I knew that it was going to be an issue when I mulched over um, and knew that my mulch was about a block and a half away after the first strong winds. So I knew that landscaping um, with succulents, um, I didn't want to incorporate any mulches. Um, I am aware, and for those of you that are interested, um, I am aware that, of course, when you do rock or when you do um, cinder or lava rock, as you can see that I did, it, it does um, seem a lot hotter. It is. It's not um, going to um, save any water because it's not going to retain any moisture. But my problem was bigger than the moisture itself because I was doing drip irrigation. That wasn't a concern. My concern was keeping it in my lawn. And the weight of it has definitely held itself over the last four years that I've had it. And I would definitely make recommendations for those of you that are in, in the Santa Ana wind patterns, um, strong Santa Ana wind patterns, I would definitely make that as a recommendation. Now, one of the reasons that I went with this color, it's a burgundy cinder lava, um, and I put a little bit of black in it just to contrast and highlight some of my plants. Um, the reason I used it is because many people from afar might see it and it does have a mulch-like appearance. And so I kind of wanted to give a little bit of that appearance and not go with um, varied colors that you might find with other rocks or stones. So yes, um, I would definitely recommend it. Um, with drip irrigation, it's never been a problem maintaining the landscape because as Marianne mentioned, I did all my plants under one hydro zone. They are all low water use plants. And you can tell also that I did a waterless, um, I did a waterless feature in my uh, fountain, all succulent plants as well. And for those of you that might be questioning, I did install my, my fountain. And I also had my husband put a couple of holes in it um, with a uh, carbide tip or diamond tip, actually, um, so that it would provide drainage. And it's worked fantastic. I've had no problems with it, obviously with my watering or um, with the plants at all. Now we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, thanks, Isabel. Real quick before we move to the next slide, I did get a question and I think you answered it, but maybe we can touch base on it again. And that was, what's, is there an advantage of using lava rock compared to other items, other hardscapes or other items in the landscape? Well, the advantage for me was that I live in a corner lot and I have um, strong Santa Ana winds usually from um, spring to early summer and I have mild winds uh, usually year-round from five to seven o'clock so I didn't want to lose the mulch material to the winds and I wanted to make sure that it was heavy enough to retain itself in my landscape. The disadvantage of course is that it is hotter uh, but because these plants really don't have a problem with um, moisture or um, needing moisture retained. Um, this was a great advantage to this kind of a landscape. Thank you. And then just one more question. Someone asked about smooth rocks and then do you need to put a, a weed protector down? One of the things that I did do um, is make sure that I removed the seed banks of my lawn. When I came, when I did remove my lawn, I did have a little bit of an infestation of some weeds. And so what I did is that I was actually watering dirt and I was doing that so that I can promote those seed banks that were still in the soil um, to germinate. And once they came up, I was able to pop them out and I was able to remove the majority of those weeds. And one thing I did do is put a weed barrier only where you see in the picture on your right hand side, um, you see a dry creek. I did put a weed barrier there. And that's just to ensure that um, being that it was going to have a lot more rock of different sizes, um, that I would it, it would facilitate my ability to be able to pluck out any weeds from there if there were any that got blown into my landscape. 
Great, thank you so much. No problem. Okay, well, let's talk about efficient irrigation. Obviously, you guys all saw my landscape and I did do drip irrigation. Um, one of the things that I want to share with you is that drip irrigation is not the only efficient irrigation. Marianne also mentioned that you have um, the uh, MP rotors that you can find in um, many of the home box stores um, to also replace some of those sprinklers that are now currently not as efficient. Now these uh, rotors are going to spray a little softer and they're going to do it almost emulating rain. Therefore, the misting, the overspray, those issues are going to resolve any problems that you may currently be having with your current sprinkler heads to reduce water waste. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Well, irrigation and controllers are very important. It's an important part of ensuring that you have an efficient um, irrigation system, whether you go with um, diff the um, sprinklers or you go with uh, drip irrigation. Um, there are many varieties out in the market. Uh, some people are going to shop for what they feel most comfortable. If they're very tech savvy, they'll probably consider a smart controller. And a smart controller is going to have many features. Um, uh, there are many features out in the market for them. Um, some of them you don't really have to do anything. You don't even have to worry about uh, turning them off when it rains because they have sensors that will determine and also weather um, is going to be um, forecasted through uh, wireless internet into the system, letting it know that it can it needs to be turned off, and it usually also estimates how many how many days it shouldn't be watering after it does uh, stop precipitating. Now, the traditional irrigation controllers usually don't give you much of a problem. Um, the only situation, of course, in these is that some may not have features, like I mentioned, such as turning off when there's precipitation or rain on days after so that um, you can ensure you use the least amount of water after it does rain. Um, these, these have to be manually taken care of. You might have to go outside and turn them off if you don't have such as the other, a smart controller where you can do it from the convenience of whatever location you're in. Um, so we don't really give any specific recommendations. I know my mom would not be comfortable whatsoever with a smart controller. And my husband and I would probably just gravitate to the smart controller features and be perfectly comfortable and happy with it. So there are many options out there and we certainly recommend that you look into what is best for you. Um, but of course, um, what makes you comfortable? If you're still comfortable feeling that control of being able to turn things off and have the ability to do so prior to letting that rain hit, um, then of course, an older feature, uh, older model, or models that have minimal amount of um, features might be best for you. Thank you. And just, and, and just as a, a reminder for those that may not know, there is an $80 rebate as well. So if you purchase a weather-based irrigation controller, also commonly known as a smart controller, there is an $80 rebate. I will be sending information at the end of class as well with more information on that. Thank you, Haley. So we were talking a little bit about those um, pop-up rotors I mentioned. Well, here's a good look at whether you have them or not um, in your landscape. Um, taking a look at the picture on your left-hand side, you can tell the traditional one kind of has a misting spray while the other, the pop-up rotor, um, is um, a little more direct and will actually reduce the amount of overspray that you may find from the traditional ones. Um, we find that these are most efficient. Much of the landscape, especially for those that might want to consider your, the garden transformation that you might be considered doing with um, California native plants or drought tolerant plants, you might want to stick with um, those uh, pop-up rotor sprinklers because these plants really do thrive with that type of watering system, more so than they do with drip irrigation. Can we go to the next one, please? So let's talk about the nuts and bolts of 
irrigation. First of all, you're going to find that most homes either already have or are going to be need a um, valve system. Now, this valve system, when it's fully installed, it's considered a watering zone. It's considered a skid. It's considered um, the basic heart of your system. And many of you will find these either on the side of your uh, home, side of your yard, or also in the backyard, um, especially if you have landscaping in your backyard. Um, you want to make sure you have these systems because every one of them is going to turn on a station. And one of the things that we talked about is that um, we're going to be providing you information. Um, the Southern Cal uh, yard transformation book is a great source for any troubleshooting that you may have with any of your valves. People sometimes find um, themselves having issues, leaks, or not able to turn on. All of those questions that you may have in regards to troubleshooting um, your valve um, are going to be um, discussed in a beautiful chart, easy to read, um, in this book. And we're going to be putting that link at the end of our um, class. Can we go ahead and change, please? Okay. Now, many of you might want to consider um, putting a, a drip irrigation valve, such as you see here. Somebody is going to be using some really nice ground cover and providing drip irrigation, which is beautiful. Um, one of the things that you want to make sure that your system has in looking at the diagram on your right hand side is making sure that if you're going to connect from your valve to a drip irrigation is that you have a screen filter. Now this is going to screen out all the sediments that might make their way in with water. Now you have to remember the emitters are going to be very small in size. So therefore, a tiny little piece of sediment may completely block and impair that emitter from releasing the appropriate amount of irrigation in. It's very crucial and is part of your maintenance upkeep, something that you need to constantly check and remove any sediments that may be settled on it. Um, and then place it back on. Another feature that is crucial and important, more so than the screen filter itself, um, is going to be a pressure regulator. Now the traditional um, valve system with only sprinklers is not required to have this, but when you have drip irrigation, because it is coming out at a very slow rate, it needs to come out at a very slow rate, it does require a pressure regulator. The water pressure coming from your home is usually going to be greater than um, 30 PSI, meaning that for your drip, your drip is going to require anywhere of an average of about 25 um, or be consistent with between 10 and 30 PSI. So there could be a big significant jump if you forget to install a pressure regulator um, and let the constant household pressure regulator bring in up to 80 PSIs. The one thing that does happen, and many people do this sometimes, is that they, um, they do install it and the system works fine. And people say, well, why are we going to buy this part? It's working just great. Well, it may work just fine the first two weeks or so or until you get a nice hot sunny day and the reason I say that is because the tubing is very malleable so it can when it warms up um, actually with the pressure that strong pressure of water it can start popping those emitters and causing problems therefore you come back a week later and you wonder why is that whole strip of you know, of plants that I just installed towards the end of the line, why are they droopy? Why are they dying? What's going on? Sometimes the reason is, is because you have an emitter that popped and all that pressure was just coming out of that one emitter hole. And that's one of the reasons that sunny, warm day just made it soft enough and that strong pressure popped it out. Um, many people have talked to me about how they don't find that 
um, uh, drip systems are very reliable because they, that does happen. But the minute I look at that valve and follow the trail looking for that pressure regulator, normally I can tell you 100% of the time they don't have it. So make sure that you do. There are some systems that are out in the market that have both pressure regulator and screen filter. As long as you know you have the pressure regulator and the screen filter, you will prevent your system from failing. Let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about a retrofit drip. One of the things that many people are doing nowadays, of course, is they're removing their lawns and they're making these beautiful, beautiful landscapes that are drought tolerant and they're using drip irrigation. Now, you can do a retrofit kit so you don't have to dig out all of the old um, sprinkler system. You can just purchase a retrofit kit which is almost like buying a um, actual sprinkler head and in the mechanism you're going to find that instead of happy, having a spring load in it it's going to have that filter and included with that filter it's also going to have a pressure regulator built in so if you want to go ahead and install it you all you have to do is cap off all your other sprinkler heads leave one one just for the retrofit the retrofit itself will have the screen filter will have the pressure regulator on it and all you have to do is on that little elbow or a T to start using your drip irrigation line now one thing that is mentioned is that EV MWD offers up to 25 cents per square foot for up to 2,000 square feet for converting your existing sprinkler um, system to drip. But you have to remember this, if you're already doing a turf replacement rebate, you cannot combine it. So keep that in mind if there's areas such as um, maybe planters or areas or even um, other areas in your yard that are not applicable because you're not removing any turf and apply for that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now we talked about the resources that we can use. The Southern Cal Transformation Guide is a step-by-step -step guide to get your lawn where you want it. Now, many of these resources that I just mentioned in regards to um, troubleshooting with your, with your valves, drip irrigation, and also even one thing that you can do is with your timers, if you're having problems with timers, there's also information in regards to troubleshooting it. I believe that this book is perfect and ideal for the homeowner. I always leave it with my customers and I recommend it to everyone because this is a resource guide that you can use even if you're not as handy in your landscape as you'd like to be and have to outsource it to your gardener or your landscaper. This information will tell you exactly what the problem is and you will know exactly what kind of a repair or what kind of a request you may ask your landscaper or your gardener to do. And believe it or not, it's having knowledge is power. And of course, when you only describe the problem and don't know the solution, you really don't know what you're paying for until they tell you what the problem is. And having this, of course, will either affirm to you that you have the right person for the job or will tell you if you don't. And I definitely recommend that you, that you uh, review it, take a look at it, and keep that in mind. There's a lot of information in regards to your um, drip irrigation and installation. It will also give you more details in regards to any questions that you may have. But if you find questions that you're still concerned about that aren't being discussed because they're specific to you, just remember you can email me at info at iewaterkeeper.org. Send me a picture or send me a question and I would gladly get back to you with any answers that I may have or resources for you. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you all joining us. And like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I'd be happy to answer any questions in regards to irrigation or anything that we've presented today.
Perfect. Thank you both, uh, Marianne and Isabella. Really appreciate that. Um, that concludes the presentation portion. If anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to go ahead and put that in the chat box right now and we can answer them live. And we will give you a couple minutes if you'd like um, to put anything in. Um, in the meantime, we did get, there were some questions that we received previously and Marianne and Isabel, if either of you would like to chime in. And one of those questions was in regards to, is there, is there the best time of the day? Like what would be the best time of the day to water? Go ahead, Isabel. Okay, well, we do recommend that you follow the guidelines of your water agency's um, suggestions. Right now, we're still considered, even though today is raining, we're still considered in a drought. And we wanna, we wanna be respectful of our resources. And of course, the best time is um, be mostly going to be before 8 a.m. Many of water agencies, including um, Ours, of course, is going to suggest that you do that. And the reason being, it's a little more scientific than just a rule or a guideline, is because it'll prevent the evaporation from taking most of that moisture away from what your intention of watering is. And while I'm talking about that, um, I do wanna remind people that um, this water book, um, the Southern Cal Yard Transformation books, has information as to how long you should be watering. So that's one of the number one questions many people have besides what time you should water. Um, always go back to your resources, but you're almost gonna go back to how often, how much you're watering because I do recommend that you look at that book. It's always, for those of you that may have lawns, you're going to have a three to four minute water runoff meaning I've done enough landscape projects with many uh, homes to tell you that you'll have runoff within three to four minutes of watering your lawn. The rest of the time that you're watering, if you have timers on them that are for 10 minutes or 12 minutes, you're actually letting it go out into your um, rain gutters, which isn't a very good idea. Of course, you, that's how you end up with lawns that may not look as healthy as they should because it only skims over the surface and it doesn't go into the loop. We recommend that this book may recommend that you go up to 12 minutes, that you'd put the first four minutes on your timer, give it at least a half hour to an hour of rest, set it again for another four minutes until all those increments accumulate those 12 minutes. And this is a great way of ensuring that every drop of water goes straight into the straight into your plants and straight into your beautiful lawn. Great, thank you. And Isabel did mention the best time would be um, before you said eight. For, for Elsinore Valley in particular, we do have guidelines that when you do water, uh, we prefer that it be between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, this is really important so that way you can avoid that sunny time when you know reduce your evaporation. Um, so like I said, that is the recommended time. And um, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, one in particular is, do the water keepers assist with retrofitting from spray to drip? Um, they, they attempted to do it themselves in the past and, and aren't, aren't sure if they did it uh, correctly. Yes, we do have we do have a program that assists with that type of um, retrofit. Um, what I would recommend you do is email Isabel at her um, email address, and we can give you more information on that. Our program is called SmartScape, and we do a, we offer a variety of services having to do with water conservation and irrigation. Perfect. And I will I will send an email to everyone after with this information as well, which include, includes the SoCal Yard Transformation Book that you can download for free, as well as the email address for additional um, information to reach out. And another question we received is how can you check the water pressure on your irrigation system? One thing that you can do is um, many of the home stores do have a valve that has a, um, you basically screw on to your um, hose bib and you would normally uh, put your garden hose in. You put that in its place, turn on the water and it would acknowledge the, the PSI that it does have for your home. And of course, if you're talking about drip irrigation, don't even bother purchasing that gadget or that tool because it is going to require that it be reduced regardless. Great, 
Thank you. Um, someone did put in the comment box um, whether it's okay to water on 9 p.m. And yes, that is a great time. It's between that 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. time frame. So 9 p.m., that is great. Um, another question we received was, should an emitter tubing be placed under or on top of the mulch? Now, the emitter tubings are probably going to be best to apply under the mulch. And the reason I say that is because, remember I talked about how that the plastic is very malleable and it just takes, a, you know, maybe a nice hot week of August or July hot triple digit weather for it to almost, you know, soften um, completely. And you want to make sure that it does have some some sort of protection. Um, another thing you you want to do is um, that mulch should be, like Marianne mentioned, at least two and a half to three inches thick. And keeping it underneath is going to ensure that it doesn't get too hot. Um, and that's another thing. You always want to make sure you do some visual maintenance on your drip irrigation. You are going to find out, like I mentioned before, that at first everything's going to work just fine. And it'll be a week or two later where you start seeing little emitter, um, uh, quarter inch emitter drip lines if you're installing those, looking like little crazy snakes all over the place. And that often happens because on the emitter end, it falls off and the water just comes out at full pressure. So please keep that in mind when you're checking for um, your landscape. Um, always go out there and at least be observant. Turn it on manually um, and be observant of what is actually going on. And if you happen to notice some emitters that are not um, that are not properly working um, or that you're noticing some of your plants are a little bit droopy, be sure to clear out that mulch or that rock and make an observation because sometimes it can be, it doesn't always happen often because we always want to install those um, uh, screen filters. Um, you always can have um, the potential of having some calcification buildup or even um, just sediment settle into it and clog it. So it's one of those uh, minor maintenance uh, visuals that you have to do. Um, the plants will use books. And for those of you that might be questioning, what kind of emitters and how many should I be putting on each plant? That Southern Cal Transformation book explains it to the T. It's perfect. It's in the back of your resource of that particular book. Perfect. Thank you, Isabel. And then just something to keep in mind, um, you know, how, how can you maintain an efficient uh, water efficient irrigation? Um, something that I like to let everyone keep in mind is that with the change in seasons, it's always important to to just you know do a general maintenance check on your irrigation um you know it's working really hard in the summertime so after you want to make sure that you know nothing nothing broke in the meantime and then nothing's leaking same thing with the fall or the winter time it's not you're not running it nearly as much so you definitely want to make sure that when you know you're going to be using it more during the warmer months just do a routine checkup it doesn't hurt to do that as the seasons change you just want to make sure you're running through your system that it's still working properly Absolutely. Hey. One more thing I want to add in regards to what you just mentioned is that, yes, you have to change that timer. If you're if you're using manual timers seasonally, you do it for the spring, you do it for the summer, you do it for the fall and you just about turn it off for the winter. In most cases, people don't realize that you don't need to be watering lawns that are dormant in the, the winter time at all. They really don't require it. And it's really a waste of our precious resources of water. Yes, no, that's a great point. And that's, you know, even though we are in Southern California and, you know, right now this week we were still getting 80, 90 degree weather at nighttime and in the early morning, it is still getting very, fairly cool. So you don't necessarily need to water as much as you would have a month or two ago because we are getting those, those cooler nights and those co cooler mornings. Right. Most homes are going to have lawns that are um, that are summer friendly, of course, that are warm season lawns. Now you're going to start finding that these um, that October, November, December, it's going to start looking brown. Please do not water it to make it green. It will not help. 
and it shouldn't because it needs to rest. It needs to preserve its energy because come spring, it's going to come in thriving and it needs that energy for that time and for summer. Great. Um, another question we received that I know personally, I've I've always had issues with this myself is how do I know whether or not I'm over or I'm underwatering? Because sometimes too much water could also kill the plant, not necessarily let it thrive. Absolutely. One thing that I always recommend people to do is to get either a chopstick from your local Chinese favorite restaurant or uh, buy a skewer, wood skewers from, you know, the kinds you use for making shish kebabs and you stick it into the soil. If you, if you are just, if you have just recently watered and you test it, you will always know, of course, that it's going to come back. The, the wood skewer is going to come back moist. And if not, it, you will know however deep you can go that it is dry. So, uh, obviously, visual observations, um, you can touch it, you can feel it, but you can use skewers. Um, and this is just a, a home quick check or tip. I mean, there are uh, probes that are that can remove, like Marianne showed, um, with an aerator, like plugs. And you can check to see how deep the water goes. Um, but, of course, if you want to just, um, just as a quick, easy how do I know how much water is going in after I watered? There you go. It's easy as putting in one of those skewers or chopsticks into the soil. Thank you, Isabel. And another question we received, you know, as we are getting into that cooler seasonal time, um, you know, there is that concern of how do you prevent your plants, uh, particularly this person said succulents, from freezing? Unfortunately, that is something that you really can't prevent. Um, one thing I do is that I have purchased um, uh, several feet of uh, shade cloths from my local um, home box store and I just drape it over especially when I know that the temperature is going to drop anywhere below 32 degrees and had I known from my weatherman that there was going to be some hail hitting me this morning I would have probably have run out there the night before and used it um, one means of doing that to ensure that I don't um, break my plants because I have a lot of succulents and I really do enjoy their good looks is that I put out um, uh, stakes, wood stakes, and then I tie wrap them with um, uh, tie wraps. I tie kind of like making a little makeshift low tent um, over them, and it's just to secure their, um, just to secure the the the. The cloth from moving if it does get a little breezy or windy or even from being too heavy on the plant so those are just quick easy tips but there's really nothing you can do and believe it or not even when they get damaged I used to hate it and panic and get so anxious but I found that many of those times when they would break they would start propagating so much more plants that I I couldn't believe it. It's, it almost seemed like every time something would break, that plant would just get more prolific over the next you know, season. So don't despair when those things do happen. They do happen often. Um, and weather can you know, um, be detrimental to succulents because they're, they, they can be very tender. And of course, they don't like extreme cold weather. Um, but I found that when they actually go through that extreme weather, it almost seems like they start having little pups all over the place and you're just now wondering where to put them all. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Another question we received was, do I need a landscape fabric under a swale in order to prevent weed from growing? No, actually, that is a misconception. Um, you don't necessarily need it. I did it because I just wanted to make sure that in the event that I skipped that opportunity of plucking my weeds, um, they weren't going to go very deep or very far with the layers of, of rocks that I put in my little dry creek. Um, but you don't necessarily need them. Um, I don't always recommend it um, to people. Um, I did it and I didn't find that anymore. It, it didn't save me anything more it didn't save me any effort um, whatsoever. If my neighbor still has his dandelions, little dandelion farm in his in front of my house, I'm always going to keep getting those um, seeds coming into my landscape. So I get to them before they bloom, and it only takes me 10, 15 minutes at the most if my husband and I get out there and 
take a bucket with us and start plucking them. So it doesn't really help. Now, for those of you that think that if you put a weed barrier, um, just to keep weeds that you already have in your lawn that you're thinking are going to get smothered and die, take caution to that because it's not going to help, especially if the weeds that are most aggressive, such as um, Bermuda, the Bermuda grass, um, that will not impair that weed, the that grass from coming through and shredding up that weed fabric and making it even more difficult to clean up or even remove. Perfect. Um, and then something I just wanted to, um, Isabel, if you don't mind uh, re retouching basis on, this was a question we received earlier, and that's in regards to how do I treat different plants um, with different watering needs. And so I know we talked about hydrozoning, but just if we could retouch basis on that in case anyone missed it. Okay, so we do recommend that you do a hydrozone landscape, meaning like Marianne mentioned, you keep all the all the plants that have the same water needs and the same um, landscaping needs grouped together. Now, if that isn't always gonna, if that doesn't always help because you have plant likes that may not always be comparable with that particular, you may need to, of course, do a little improvisation um, and take into consideration that your plants are going to either suffer or they're going to um, potentially um, suffer in a means of not having enough moisture or having too much. So you may have to find a, 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 a balance in um, the appearance or how well your plant thrives. Um, one thing I know is that I've done it myself. I've put plants simply because I like to see them combined together, but they don't always necessarily work. Um, what I do is that I rather um, underwater than overwater. And, and that's a recommendation I always share with people um, because of course, plants will die a lot faster, a lot quicker, from overwatering than underwatering. Um, in situations where you want to consider combining, I would deter you from that if you're going to do your entire landscape that way. Um, the reason being is because, of course, you're always going to have some plants thriving and others not. Um, and, and you'd have to settle with the appearance of that um, of, of those plants. Um, but of course, you can combine in that area two, two um, sprinkler system, um, uh, irrigation systems, one for the low water use and one for the medium or high water use and be specific to that particular plant. Drip irrigation would be the most ideal way of doing that. Obviously the sprinklers do not work because you'll either underwater or overwater the plants and they're watering in general the whole entire area. Great. Thank you. So hopefully that'll help. <laughs> Go with drip irrigation if you feel like you want to combine them um, because it'll give you the option to put that water specifically to that plant and you may have to add a, um, a separate system to water longer, especially those plants that are high or medium water usage. Yes, and it's important to remember that with the drip irrigation system, unlike a sprinklers when you're watering, you know, anywhere from five to 20 minutes, per station with the drip system because it is going at a much slower rate. I mean, it's important to know that you actually would be watering for longer periods of time and to ensure that it's getting enough water supply. Right. And then um, let's, we have another question that's, are there any recommendations on what kind of grass, grass for lawns in Lake Elsinore? Do either of you have any um, recommendations? Well, um, Lake Elsinore is actually a uh, 9B um, climate zone. So you want to make sure that you're aware of it um, and you go to your local uh, nurseries and consider your options. Um, I once had to visit a home of a homeowner who had hired a landscaper. This landscaper gave him plenty of plant choices and everything looked beautiful upon installation but he was in the Inland Empire and this landscaper was not in California. Many of the plants that he had to purchase 
were from out of state. And what he found out that first season was that they were impossible to maintain and obviously keep up. He lost many of the plants because they didn't thrive in his particular microclimate and environment. So I do recommend that before we give you a specific name of a certain lawn that you might be able to use, I do recommend that you go to your local nurseries, particularly those that might be in your area, because if they are nurseries that are um, uh, growing their own, um, you might have a better uh, choice of plant, of, um, of lawn material that is going to thrive in your area specifically because it's obviously growing there. So keep that in mind. Anytime you do not only your lawn, but any kind of plant choices, your local nurseries, if they have plants that are thriving, that are selling well in their nursery, those will probably do very well and thrive in your own landscape. And I just wanted to add, if you are going to seed your own lawn, what's really great is a lot of the seed mixes now have actually been developed for um, warm areas that require less water. And on the actual bag of seed, it'll say, um, you know, this seed mix takes 30% less water and thrives in hot, hot climates. So there's a lot of seed mixes. I believe you currently said you have fescue. Um, there's a lot of seed mixes that look similar to fescue, but they actually are water wise and do really well in hot, hot areas. So if you're seeding yourself, the options on the market are greater now than they've ever been. Great. Thank you. And another question we had received was in regards to um, how can you plug existing holes into a, um, the main tube line? I know that there actually are plugs that um, you can just purchase at a local supply store, but if you have anything additional you'd like to add to that? Okay, so let's say you have um, already done your drip irrigation and you have a plug that is not in the place that you'd like for it to be, or you want to relocate something. Um, the home stores will have uh, what they call goof plugs. Um, you can use it. It's a um, it looks like a part of the end that broke off of an emitter, and it goes straight into it, and it completely blocks water from exiting out of that plug itself. Now, if you want to, uh, if you want to use um, any kind, there's several different kinds of tools. Some of them may look like um, hole punchers like the old hand help uh, a pick that is a short stubbed pick and you can use that to pry that hole i want to give you a, a, a insider's trade trick that you can use when you're doing that you're going to find that this um, quarter inch emitter is very hard and um, and not easy to puncture. That's why many, many people use those hand, handheld looking hole puncher ones. Um, but if you're going to do just a few, I wouldn't pay the 10 or 15 or dollars that they, they normally cost. I'd go for the 99 cent one and go with the handheld one. But it is hard. And one thing that you can do is that you can take a nice mug of hot water with maybe some sort of a sock or a cloth and put it right over that plastic and then you can go ahead remove it after it's softened a little bit and it'll go right through like butter and it'll it'll be great thank you um, and the question we received is um is there what's the best time of the year to plant a uh, a dwarf orange tree any recommendations Definitely um, springtime. And the reason I suggest that is because you have frost to concern yourself with. Mm -hmm. So of course, let's wait for all that frost to pass and um, and then go ahead and, and do, do the installation in, in the nice um, um, warmer springtime weather. Yes, I agree. I know personally for me, I planted my orange tree around March or April time about two years ago. Um, and it's been, that was the perfect timing. It's, it's, it's growing really well. I haven't gotten the oranges yet. And I'm hoping for, for next year, but definitely waited right after that cold season. So that way you can start getting that warmth and make sure it doesn't and avoid the frost time. So great, great recommendation. Absolutely. Uh, 
Another question, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone might know this, but it's in regards to um, a lawn that's more resistant to dog urine. Uh, you know, for me, I, I also have a dog. When, when, when he goes to the bathroom, it might make that grass a little yellow where he goes to the bathroom. Um, do either of you have any recommendations? Pets tend to always want to use the same little spot or the same little area. You'll find that they like one particular corner or one particular area. Um, but then you do have the occasional uh, dog that might just not have any regard and just go anywhere and all places. Um, but as a deterrent, um, I would definitely use um, cayenne pepper in the areas that you want to make sure that they do not go. Cayenne pepper is going to deter them because they always go with scent. Um, it's going to deter them from wanting to go there. Um, it's not harmful for the pet. They might sneeze. They might not like it. They'll probably rub their nose. But they'll also remember, and they'll also remember the scent, and they'll stick to an area. But be sure to always leave an area for them because you can't just do your entire yard um, and, and assume that they're not going to want to go. They'll eventually... You know, if you do your entire yard um, and spray your entire yard, um, they'll eventually find other locations, of course. But um, you want to just specifically leave an area for your for your family pet. Now, one of the questions um, I think was what type of lawn holds up best to a dog? And from my experience, uh, my next door neighbor has a front yard and the grass is St. Augustine. And I have to tell you that that grass holds up like no other grass I've ever seen. <laughs> it's just, you know, St. Augustine is really drought tolerant and it's easy to maintain. Um, it is technically, people don't realize this, but St. Augustine grass technically falls into the category of a weed. But if you keep it maintained, it is, is, is the best dog proof grass ever. And it grows like crazy, but you really have to keep you, it, the maintenance of it. You have to make sure that you keep it contained into a contained area. But as far as grass for a dog, I would recommend St. Augustine hands down. I agree. Uh, one of the things about St. Augustine, for those of you that are kind of lifting your ear right now and saying, okay, this is where I'm going to go with now. Um, please remember that you're not going to find it in rolls like you do the traditional uh, turf you're going to find it in flats and normally the flats can range between 16 to 19 or even a little bit higher now um, and as far as 16 to 19 dollars and don't despair by the price because you do not install it as a roll you install it as a plug because it's invasive it is going to cover um, so for those of you that have um, maybe want to replace that lawn and put it make it user friendly for your pet um, please make sure that you have very um, sound and secure barriers between your lawn and your um, your plant turn areas because otherwise they just might make their way right through Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, one of the questions we actually we had quite a few people that had submitted um, information when they registered, just wanting to know how how do they prevent water leaks? How do they ensure that they have a water efficient system? You know, just different different um, questions regarding that same topic. And you know, this is something we we talked about previously, but I wanted to touch base on is it's really important to make sure you're doing routine checkups of your irrigation system. If you think it looks okay, it still does not hurt to just run your system every so often just to make sure that nothing broke in the meantime when you weren't when you didn't see it and just making sure that everything's watering as properly as it should you know your irrigation system it's, it will need adjustments from season to season so it doesn't hurt to to make sure you're routinely doing those maintenance checkups on your irrigation system absolutely and one of the things that you will find in that south on the south Southern California Yard Transformation Book is a step-by-step -step guide with regards to troubleshooting any problems that you may have with your irrigation, including the concern of leaks. Of course, we always we have been mentioning throughout this presentation that op visual observation is the most ideal means of it, of seeing it. Um, but you're going to find that um, many times uh, sprinklers themselves are at a tilt or at an angle. And what I mean by that is that, for example, instead of being straight and erect, 
they have a little tilt on them. Now, usually that tilt is caused by mowing over them and pushing them, it being pushed over. Um, a lot of times that can happen um, uh, because they're not properly installed, um, meaning that they should have been probably dug a little deeper and they gave it a tilt so that they can hide um, as they normally want to be um, below the surface. And so those issues can cause irrigation problems of overspray or not spraying directly. For those of you that have seen in your lawns that half moon crescent kind of dry spot, that's one of the reasons it happens is because one of your, one of your um, sprinkler heads is missing an area because of a tilt or an angle that isn't properly covering the entire area as it should. And it could be gradual over time, or it could just happen um, over a mowing of some sort that you may have experienced. So be sure to check them out. Make sure that they stand out erect and correctly. Um, and obviously you wanna make sure that you don't have that um, a misting overspray because it's very common with the misting overspray that you have way too much pressure on your sprinklers. And if you have a problem with that, you might want to consider having um, that irrigation have a reducer of pressure so that it can, it can function properly. Having that problem is, I've seen it several times, and one in particular was when a gentleman turned it on and I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, it looked like fog instead of, of, of uh, turning on his sprinklers. It just looked like a thick fog that I couldn't see five feet up in front of me. And what was happening is that when the builder put in his irrigation line, it did not connect with the house. So what was happening is that it was connecting directly without any pressure regulators whatsoever connecting into his sprinkler system. Now this was a this was a builder mistake that has been that had been going on for a long time. And the water agency was severely concerned about the water usage that that was coming out from that home and of course some of the erosion that it was causing from that hillside where that home was. So you want to make sure that you don't mint your sprinklers missed because there's always a solution to installing a pressure regulator directly to where it needs to be. And the, all those problems that I just mentioned, if you feel like you have them, be sure to look at that chart. It is a great clean looking chart. It doesn't, it doesn't look very busy for the eye. You look at what your problem is and it'll give you the solution in the next line or the next column over. Great. Thank you so much, Isabel and Marianne. I really appreciate your time. We have reached that 1130 mark, so we are going to go ahead and close. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email with additional resources, which includes a free downloaded link to the SoCal Yard Transformation book. Um, we highly recommend that you look at that. It's a, it's a terrific resource. In addition, Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District does offer a variety of rebates that are specific for irrigation. So that is another uh, resource I really recommend you take a look at. Um, again, this will all be sent to you via email, but of course, if you have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, I really appreciate everyone taking the time. Of course, we wish we could see you all in person, but safety comes first. So until then, uh, we will continue to do these virtual classes in the future. Um, and we will, in addition to the email I'm sending out, there will be a survey. If you fill out that survey, you will be entered into a raffle to win a $25 gift card to a local restaurant. So I highly recommend you uh, fill that survey out. We actually do tremendously appreciate your feedback. I review all of those surveys and then I use that information to craft our future workshops. So I really do appreciate your feedback because I'm taking what you were requesting and creating more workshops for you. Um, again, thank you everyone so much for attending and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.